Hi, we're the hosts of the Fresh Hell podcast. I'm Annie in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna in Vienna, Austria. Join us every Wednesday for a new terrible story. I focus mostly on cases in the United States, and not just true crime, like the terrifying axe murders on Smutty Nose Island, but also shocking stories like the New Jersey shark attacks of 1916. And I love to tell you about more obscure European cases. And let me tell you, Germany has produced more cannibals than one would think. So if you're a fan of true crime, but you also enjoy terrible stories of all sorts, give us a listen. We'll tell you everything you need to know, and then some. Come find Fresh Hell Podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Auf Wiedersehen. Hope to see you soon. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. I'm CJ, host of a new podcast called Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT Community. In this podcast, we cover cases not so well known, as well as more notorious ones. A lot of interesting info mixed with a little bit of snark, but always focusing on the empathy I feel for the victims. Please give us a listen on your favorite podcast app. Push subscribe. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. You're doing swell? I'm doing ever so fantastically well. Oh, good. That sounds good. There's a nice little crisp airflow I going. Love it. Finally. You know what that made me do? Made me happy. Well, I know it makes you happy, but you know what it prompted me to do? What? Prompted me to add sweatshirts, <gasps> hoodies, and long sleeve t shirts to our Etsy store. Oh, oh, I want one. That's I know. Right. I want one. I they want look one. cool. They, they're great. They're, I added um, the colors like a hunter military green, which I love. It's fantastic. I, have a t-shirt. I love it. I always get compliments on it. And um, this really cool blue looks really very cool. So if you want to do it, head on over to our Etsy store, which is it's under our true crime podcast, all one word. You can find us there. Hmm. They're awesome. Check it out. Check it out. What else you got going on, Jen? I have some shout outs. Shout out. Shout, shout outs out. for our lovely five star reviewers. Did you get the one that said that she was going to faint when she heard her name? Or oh, she, I fangirl. did. She said, I'm gonna She's going to fangirl okay. that one. That's Rose David. Rose David! We're fangirling over you, Rose David. That's right, buddy. Thank you so much, sweetheart. We love you. That made me happy. That made me happy, too. Yeah. Really made my day. Made All of these made me happy. Yeah. Big thank you to Madison Lily. Hi, Madison Lily. Betch. All those H's. I loved it. Whose real name is actually Bree from California. Oh. Steph Carr, 85. Thanks, Steph Carr. Wispy White. And Jake Loveless. Jake. You guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for leaving a five-star review. And if you'd like to hear your name out there on our big old podcast, you know. The, big old podcast. Huge. Huge. You know, the little podcast that could called Our True Crime Podcast. Just leave us a five-star review on Apple and Stitcher, and let us know that you do, especially if you leave it on Stitcher or anywhere else, because we probably won't find it or yeah. see it in f- if it's soon. Hidden, hidden in there somewhere. So anyway, what you got for us today? Oh, this is a, it's a, it's something, let me tell you. It's a humdinger of it, one? Well, it's just really evil. I mean, there's no other way to say yeah. it. All right. I'm, I'm, well, good thing it's Halloween. Well, things evil. Oh, yeah, this is terrible. All right. Sock it to us. <laughs> Thank you.
Today's episode takes us to Opelika, Alabama, which I've never heard of, but I'm sure it's a lovely place. Opelika, I may. Right? Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As I was putting this together, what my mom would always say when we were younger, actually, she still says it today, is what you worry about will never happen. It's what you never see coming that will get you. Yep. And I totally believe that. And that phrase just kept running through my head as this is, I mean, nobody could, you couldn't even think of this, Mm -hmm. right? January 30th, 2002, a daughter's worst nightmare was about to become reality. Katrina Ryan had always been close to her mom, calling her every morning right after she got to work. It was a small gesture, but one that both of them looked forward to as it had become part of their daily routine. I talk to my mom every day, too. Uh, it's I do, too. It's kind of comforting. So on this morning when Katrina phoned her mom, there was no answer. She immediately thought it was a bit odd, but, you know, maybe her mom had plans and Katrina simply forgot. So she waited a few hours and she tried again. Still no answer. Katrina is now starting to get a bit concerned, but wasn't going to panic. Not yet, anyway. At lunch, Katrina phoned again, and there was still... At this point, Katrina knew something was not quite right, and she decided she better head over to the house. As she pulls up, she notices immediately that all the cars are parked in the driveway. There wasn't one missing, so they didn't go anywhere. She made her way around to the back of the house, and that's when her stomach dropped. The back door was clearly broken. It was hanging slightly open. It looked as if somebody had kicked it in and the doorknob was missing. Katrina enters the back of the house and quickly sees her dad lying on the floor. He's covered in blood. It's obvious he's dead. She's trying to, like, scream his name, and he's not moving. She runs through the house, frantic, looking for her mom, and she finds her mom in the bedroom, and she, too, is dead. Katrina goes to call 911, picks up the phone, and there's no dial tone. The phone line had been cut. Hmm. She runs outside, gets into her car, and she goes to find the nearest neighbor she has to drive because it's kind of like, you know, farmland a little bit. She manages to ask them to call 911 because somebody killed her parents and then she faints Aww. and falls to the ground. She got that out and then fainted. She held it together till then. That's remarkable, really. Adrenaline. Exactly. I couldn't imagine that. Me, I don't ever want to imagine that. either. Dumb phone. Okay. Police arrived to the scene where it is determined that Katrina's father, 68-year-old Thurman Ratliff, had been shot three times, including in the back of the head. Katrina's mother, 62-year-old Catherine Ratliff, had suffered multiple gunshot wounds, including a gunshot wound to the back of the head as well. What also becomes clear is that the couple were not merely shot, but tortured in the process. The house was in disarray, which was out of the ordinary for this couple, suggesting that somebody was looking for something in particular, or something of value, Mm -hmm. attempting to rob them. It was clear that the killer or killers knew something about these residents and how they lived. Air vents were pulled out and searched. The attic had been searched, even leaving the ladder down to the ground. All the cabinets in the kitchen and bathroom were open and had been gone through. Just like a lot of older folks, they like to keep some cash on hand, Mm -hmm. you know, just for that in-case thing that people Mm -hmm. tend to do a lot, especially the older generation. And just like some older folk, it was not 20 or 25 bucks that we keep on hand for the emergency field trip the mm-hmm. kids forgot to tell us about until the morning of. Uh, we know this because the perpetrators actually forgot to search well. And deep in one of the bathroom closets, there was a metal can that they found that had not been discovered by the perpetrators. And inside the can was some money. And when I say money, I mean enough to buy two nice cars and pay for them in cash. Oh, $87,000 wow. in cash. You know, when my father-in-law died and they were going through everything, they found stacks of money everywhere. I, guess, I think it's the in older books. generation, too, and, with the banks yeah. and the not trusting people. Because it is kind of weird if you think the theory, hi, I get paid, and here's all my money. Here, you keep it for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll take it, and I'll give you a little percent of it a month. And I yeah. get that. You but know. yeah, they to this day, I think they still find money around the place. How would you... And I never had enough money to hide. I know. Same. Like I said, I'm scrunching up, you know, $3 for the field trip. So, Jen, it's now clear that the motive was robbery, but the Ratliffs were very well liked in their community. They had no enemies to speak of in this small, quaint little town. Mr. Ratliff 
had been a salesman his entire life, and he was an independent salesperson for the Snap-on Tool Corporation, mm-hmm. you know, those, those things. So he'd make his way through the community selling tools to the local mechanics, while Catherine was a beauty operator, oh, among other things. A beautician? That's what my grandma used to always call it. I have to go to my beauty operator. She also did, a, you know, some other stuff, but she would do, um, she would often do the hair of the elderly women in town. And I'm sure that was like super fun because they the just set and curl. Yep, set and curl. Mm-hmm. Wrap the old toilet Or a curl paper. and set. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know what it is. Authorities are at a loss as to who would want to kill the sweet couple, but they dig in immediately and they're confident that they can figure it out. Mm-hmm. Nope, they can't. First thing that they do is take a look at the type of weapon that was used to commit the crime. It turns out it was a 9 millimeter handgun, but there's evidence that suggests maybe another weapon was present as well. This means that there may have been more than one person in the house that night, Usually. more mm-hmm. than one killer. The second thing authorities find are some footprints leading away from the Ratliff home. The footprints travel through a field into some tire tracks. Now, this is January in the south, so I'm going to say maybe it might be a little rainy, a little wet, a little soggy. Mm -hmm. So the tire tracks and the footprints are pretty clear. The imprints they made in the ground are pretty obvious. So they were able to get clear prints is what you're saying? Yes. Gotcha. Investigators have a little evidence, but that's it. They don't have any suspects. They have to sit back and wait for a little bit, that is. Only two weeks later, another event occurs, a crime so heinous that it rocks the community. February 17th, 2002, a 54-year-old man by the name of Forrest Boyer, who happens to be a local used car salesman and single father, had just finished getting his 12-year-old son named Brett ready for the next day, which would be a Monday, day of school. They chit-chatted a little bit, laid out his clothes, had had dinner. You know, they're kind of just doing their usual Sunday night routine. Forrest, who friends called Butch, had just put him down. He's kind of relaxing. He goes to sit at the kitchen table. He's going to pay some bills, you know, go through some paperwork. When all of a sudden, somebody knocks at the door. Hmm, okay. So he gets up. Now, mind you, it's 10 p.m., and that's a little unusual, a little late for somebody to be knocking Mm -hmm. on the door. So he gets up. No one gets kind of weird, but he thought, you know, maybe it's important. So he goes, gets ready to open the door, and somebody shouts, police, open up. Ooh, now he's got to. Shocked and sure that they have the wrong house, Butch opens the door only to be greeted by two men who show him their badges and a search warrant for drugs. Hmm. Butch tries to tell them that they're making a huge mistake. He's just a dad. He's not affiliated with anybody that does drugs. The men rush inside and immediately start looking around. They tell Butch he is under arrest for possession of drugs. Butch tries to argue, but they handcuff him. The men take him outside, and they're getting ready to place him inside the car, which seems like it's an unmarked police car. Oh, because mm-hmm. it's not? Because it's not marked, right? Or a police car. As he's getting ready to get in the car, he mentions to the men, um, my son's inside. What are we going to do with him if I'm being taken into custody? Mm-hmm. And that's... I just, my heart broke when he said that because I was like, oh, oh, nobody. The men are puzzled, not realizing that young Brett was inside. They place Butch inside the car and return to the house to get Brett, whom they also handcuff and bring outside to the waiting car. Ooh. Yeah, man, would you, I'm sure he's kicking himself every day. Whew. With Butch and Brett inside the car, the two men hop in and tell them that they're being taken into the police station for booking. Butch is sure this is a misunderstanding. He's confident he'll be able to fix it as soon as they get to the station and he explains everything that they have the wrong guy. Butch is kind of, you know, he's calmed down. He's okay mm-hmm. with it. I wouldn't have been. However, if my kid handcuffed my kid, no way. So Butch is pretty confident about this. Yeah. That is until they drive past Uh-oh. the police station mm-hmm. and his confidence fades. Butch now knows that he and his son are in trouble. The men drive out to a remote area known as Seal, which is located in Alabama. It's kind of a rural part. In this area of the county, they are constructing a highway. And at this time, it had only had the dirt path, you know, the right. right. So you can see where the concrete road or asphalt road is going to be. But at that time, they just had the dirt path and the construction equipment there. They just plowed everything down. Very dark, no light shed, no other cars. It was literally in the middle of nowhere. So when they get out there, the men drag Butch and his son out of the out of the car. They start screaming at them. They start hollering at them. The men tell Butch 
that they know about the safe in his house and that they know he keeps $100,000 in there. Now, Butch is shocked and he's, you know, trying to remain calm. And he's like, listen, dude, I don't have a safe. I may have some cash in the house. It's not a lot. But you know what? You can have all of that and more as long as you don't hurt my son and I. It's right? very in cold blood. Just like a bad episode of World's Dumbest Criminals. Mm-hmm. They do a you bangy do a U-turn, and they take them back to Butch's house. Right. Once inside the house, Butch takes the criminals in to a box in the closet. The box would end up containing a bit slightly over $40,000. Holy, who? Mm, that's a lot of cash to keep in the house. Thank you. Since they have been given this money and so freely, they begin badgering Butch for more. We know you have more. Where is it? Just give it to us. We know it. We know it. Now, Butch is adamant. And he's like, listen, if I had it, I'd give it to you. You just drug us out in the middle of the night. Drug us back. I'm giving you all this. You need to just go. You need to leave us. Whatever. They would not quit looking. They kept looking. In the course of looking, they stumble upon a gun. It is a snub Uh nose revolver. And it didn't even belong to Butch. It actually belonged to his housekeeper who had left it there. (laughs) I know. You know what's going to happen with that. The assailants then load both Butch and Brett back into the car and drive them back out to that construction area where they were earlier. Once they got to the location, Butch and Brett, both still handcuffed, were forced out of the car. This is heartbreaking. At this point, Butch is begging them to not hurt Brett. Let Brett go. Please, please. He's begging with them. I will do anything. If you let him go, you can do whatever you want to Mm me. It's not working. No. Butch is led away from the car, and at this point, he realizes that their destiny had already been planned. The men knew all along what they were going to do with Butch and Brett, because right in front of Butch, a shallow grave had already been dug. The hope that he once had is now gone. One of the men reach up and slit Butch's throat oh. ear to ear. Butch falls forward, God. and one of the men bends down, kind of climbs on his back, and tells him, whispering, just go to sleep. Just shut your eyes. Just go to sleep. Is what? It, just die is basically what he's saying. Brett, the little 12-year-old, is witnessing all of this happening, and he's crying and screaming and pleading with the killers. Please don't hurt my daddy. Please stop. Please don't hurt my daddy. One of the killers turns to the other one and tells him, I killed one. Now it's your turn. The man takes the gun, which they had stolen from Butch's house, and he shoots the 12-year-old Brett in the head. The first shot did not kill Brett, and this really frustrated the man, really upset him. So he began screaming and and shouting, saying, little fucker won't die. Then he shoots Brett two more times. The man tosses Brett's body in the empty grave. And to make sure their job was finished, they go back and they cut Butch's throat another time and toss him on top of his son's body. They then toss the gun into the hole with them. The killers then begin to bury the bodies by putting dirt on them. But they also had purchased lime earlier Mm -hmm. and they put that on them. They work hard to conceal their awful deeds And when they are confident that no one will ever discover these two bodies in this desolate area, the murderers drive off. Uh, Jen, there's just one thing. What's that? Butch was not dead. He remained very still and he tried not to breathe as the killers were putting dirt on top of him and his son. He had a life-threatening injury, but when he heard the motor start and drive off, he waited until the noise became more and more distant. Butch then begins digging himself out and then pulls his son out as well. Butch is trying desperately to revive his little boy, but it was too late. Mm. Brett had died from his gunshot wounds. Realizing Butch could do no more for Brett, he crawled. He literally crawled out into the highway. He crawled up through this field, through that dirt, up into the highway where where he could be found. Like a miracle, Butch made it to the road and was able to flag down help. He is exhausted covered in blood and dirt. He tells the motorist what happened, and the motorist called 911. Now, could you imagine being the motorist coming upon that? Lucky they stopped. Right? I was thinking the same thing. Because I don't know if I could I don't know if I would either. It was a guy. Maybe that helped, but I don't know. Sergeant Daryl Powell was the first to arrive to the scene. Powell is shocked to see Butch in the condition he's in. There's blood everywhere. He calls into the station, and he tells them, what's going on. But he also says you could see Butch's Adam's apple coming out along with him kind of holding up most of his neck. Is that, that's terrible. You got to do what you can to survive though. I, you know, unbelievable. 
An ambulance soon arrives and wants to take Butch to the hospital, but Butch insists he will not go until they find his son first. He already knows his son's passed away, but Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to leave him out there, which I totally understand. It's heartbreaking. Sergeant Powell searches the area and finds Brett's lifeless body right away. It's exactly where he told him it would be. The EMTs are telling Butch they really need to go to the hospital. Stat, that wound will kill him. He will die. I mean, mm-hmm. his, I can't believe he survived. Then they kind of tug at his heartstrings and they say, listen, if you die out here, those killers will never pay for what they did to your son. And that's enough to convince him that he mm-hmm. needs to go and that his boy will be looked after by the people on site. Police are questioning Butch on the way to the hospital, and he's able to provide some details. He tells police that the police were driving a white Crown Victoria and that they also stole his keys, which had not only his car keys, but his house keys on it. Ooh, they're back at the house looking for more. Wait, exactly. Butch, in all his frenzy, I mean, can you believe this, was able to convey this to officers and then added that he thought that the men were so money crazed, so crazy about money and getting that money, and we know you have it, Mm -hmm. that he thought that they might actually go back to the house to look for more money, right? Yep, that's what I thought. Talk about inside under stress, right? Like delivering that, whoa. Police phone into the station and tell them to immediately send a card to Butch's residence and just sit tight, you know, look around, see if they notice anything, anything odd, anybody coming and going. Right. And wouldn't you know it, those two idiots come back to the house and it wasn't even 30 minutes after this. The Crown Vic pulls up, notices the police car kind of, you know, casually drifting by. They kind of panic Mm -hmm. and the police end up following the Crown Vic. The Crown Vic does not stop. They follow it for a little bit, and then they pull it over for, obviously. The Crown Vic? Yeah. Is that how you're talking now? Well, yeah. Crown Victoria. Crown Vic, yeah. What's wrong with that? What it's called? You want me to say Victoria every time? It's a Crown Victoria. I or, said it or once. Or the car. Okay. Okay. I said it earlier. You just want to sound cool. You want to get all the cool kids to like you. <laughs> I just want to write. I, I always um, abbreviate in here all the time. Police officers pull over the car. Inside the car, they find a bail bondsman who had no previous criminal record, and his name is Michael Carruth. Carruth had a large amount of cash in his pocket, and, you know, he seemed to have a little blood on his clothes and his shoes and, you know, on his hands. And you know what? He even had a set of keys matching the description that Butch had given the police. Carruth was taken into custody and sent to the Russell County Sheriff. The Crown Vic, or Crown Victoria, was impounded, and it had lots of evidence inside it, such as handcuffs, fake police gear, and shackles. Oh, and a narcotics officer's hat. Remember, they pretended like they were on a drug search. Mm -hmm. Carruth will not tell police anything. He's not giving anything up. He claims he wasn't involved, didn't have anything to do with it, don't even know what they're talking about. They obviously have the wrong person, right? We've all heard that. He's smug and indifferent because, after all, why shouldn't he be? There's no witnesses to what happened. Mm -hmm. No one was left alive to talk. That's what he's thinking at this time. That smug attitude is about to get an adjustment. A police officer tells Carruth, Hey, buddy, got some bad news for you. Butch Bauer's alive. Carruth goes completely pale. He knows he's SOL. What a piece of shit. They... mm -hmm. Carruth is now panicking, knowing he can no longer claim to know nothing about this crime, being that, you know, he was Uh actually caught literally red-handed because he had some blood on his hands. The wheels start spinning as to what he's going to do now. That's not all. The officers held back a little piece of info that Butch had given them er earlier. These guys were about the dumbest criminals ever. You see, Butch, he actually knew one of these killers. In fact... When all this was taking place, he called him by his name. Oh, nice. Right? The man was Jimmy Brooks Jr. Unlike Carruth, Brooks did have a criminal record, mostly for small things, breaking and entering automobiles, petty theft, some other small criminal activities. No mastermind here. The connection here is that Brooks' father was a repossession man, a, a repo guy. Mm-hmm. And in Butch's car business, his used car business. Right. He would sometimes use Brooks's father to repo the cars for him. And there was a few times that Jimmy Brooks Jr. would actually accompany his father on some of these repos. Huh. 
So he knew Butch. Is this story a killer? Did he, did he not know that the guy knew him? Brett knew him? Yeah, he did, I guess. They're idiots. Wait, it gets worse. Because they're idiots. How could they not? They didn't. See, he thought that they were going to they were gonna be dead, so it didn't matter if he knew him or not. still. Police head out to arrest Jimmy Brooks Jr. When they arrive, Brooks is hanging out in the backyard burning something. And guess what, Jen? It's not barbecue. Mm-mm. Mm. He's burning what authorities believe to be clothes and other items associated with the kidnapping and murder that took place only 12 hours before. Police go inside. They find a bunch of cash in his house. Right. Which every younger person carries that. They also found some marijuana. Mm-hmm. And to prove how not smart he was, he was worried that his girlfriend was going to be implicated in all this because they lived together. Like, he brought that up out of nowhere. Yeah, not real smart. Well, he loves her. I love you, Mickey. <laughs> I love you, Mallory. No, yeah. No, it's true. But Sweet, maybe? I don't know. Brooks is hauled into the police station where Sorry, he had answer. met where he immediately starts talking, and it is quite the story. Mm. I love people that just, they're all big and brave until then they, like, oh, yeah. Whew. Brooks tells police that six months ago, he was sitting in jail and unable to post bond. Brooks goes on to say that Carruth put up money for him to get out, which was $35,000. Brooks was unable to ever pay that back or get to that money to get out in the first place. And Carruth knows this. And this is where the you owe me thing comes into play here. Caruth tells Brooks, you need to either start paying me back or I'm going to send you right back in there, which I don't even think is possible. Is it? Could a bail bonds may even send you back to revoke the money that they gave you? I think so. Could they? I don't even know. I'm not really up on my bails. Right. We better call Saul. We better. Yes, we better. Brooks then tells Caruth he knows a man by the name of Butch who keeps a large amount of money inside his home. Mm. Brooks claimed that he had seen it with his own eyes when he went out there once with his dad on a repo job. Mm. Brooks also tells police that it was never their intention to kill Butch and Brett, but just to take them out there and strand them in that desolate area. Okay, because uh, I guess he you forgot. Did it twice, buddy. Well, and he forgot they pre dug a grave. Oh, and they bought lime. Like, come on. That yeah. was, you don't do that to, that was planned all along. Here's my favorite part. They weren't just stealing this money because they were greedy, Jen. The two of them had plans. They had aspirations. They had goals. Yeah. They were saving money. They were going to go into business together Mm. and start an underground marijuana hydroponics operation. Wow. It's pretty good, right? Got dreams. Everybody's got dreams. While Brooks is singing like a canary, Caruth is still maintaining he had nothing to do with any of this. Brooks has given authorities more than enough to fill in all the dots, right? But hey, you know, why he's there, maybe he's feeling, you know, guilty or friendly or maybe he just likes to talk to people. He says, you know, um, I got something else to tell you. So they're like, okay, because so far everything you said has been right on. Brooks tells investigators, so I know a little something about this double murder that happened up in huh. Lee County. Brooks tells them that Caruth is the one who planned the Ratliff robbery that chilly January day. Brooks had worked for the Ratliff Sun. And he said he found out that the older couple may, may keep large sums of money inside the home. <laughs> oh, and you know what? It wasn't just the two of us. There was actually three of us. And um, not just Caruth and Brooks, right? A man by the name of James Gary was also there that day. And Caruth trapped him in the same snare that he had used with Brooks. Caruth posted bond for Gary. And because Gary couldn't pay it back, Gary now had to work for him. Police moved to get Gary into custody. But guess what? They don't have to look too hard because guess what? Gary's already in prison on a drug charge. Well, color me shocked. Right? Authorities pull Gary in for questioning and Gary tells them that he was forced to do this by Caruth because of that him getting bonded mm-hmm. out. Just kind of smart on Caruth's part. Like he looked for these people that would do yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, that's what I was going right? to ask you. Did he know these people beforehand? Before no, they came into his desperate. bail bond? I think he, he you can... <laughs> Smell desperation, you know what I mean? He's oh, I like, know. I can make them do Every that. time they you did. come over, that's what I smell. But Shut up, Jennifer. When, um... I think it, this was a small town, so we might have known... They weren't buddies. They didn't, uh-huh. They're like... They're, so the ages are vastly different, right? So that's not like they hang right. out the So Caruth really wanted to do the underground thing? Oh, yeah. Caruth and Brooks, what they were, but here's... We'll talk about that at the end, okay. which is where... Because, you know, this is... Whatever. Right, okay. Gary informs police of what exactly happened that night. He tells them that Caruth dropped off Brooks and himself outside the Ratliff home 
with strict instructions on what to do if they had to. They kick in the back door, which startles Thurman, who runs towards the noise and towards the door. Brooks and Gary demand money from him right away, but before he can even do anything, they shoot him in the hand. While all this is occurring, Catherine is panicking. Like she's hearing guns, Mm -hmm. whatever. So she runs to the back of the house. She's going to try to hide, but also they have a gun back there. So as she's darting back towards the back, Brooke sees her, and he starts to run after her, and he chases her. Catherine is trying to get to the gun to fight him off, to fight off both men. Brooks begins fighting with her, and as they struggle, he's becoming irate. Like, he's not used to this pushback, I guess, right? So he's yelling at her, and he's demanding to know where the money is. And at this point, Catherine falls to her knees. She literally falls to her knees and begs him to stop, begs for her life, begs for them to leave. He just looks right at her and places a bullet in her head. Oh, that's... Now, mind you, they've got no money yet, Uh and they've already shot two people. Brooks then goes back into the living room, and he demands that Gary shoot Thurman. So Gary fires the shot, and it enters Thurman's lower back. Does not kill him. Mm -mm. Gary goes on to say at this point, Brooks, who is none too happy with Gary at this point, takes the gun from his hand and actually shoots Thurman himself by placing a bullet in his head, and that does kill him. So here's where I'm going to ask you. If you go there to rob these folks, which they claim they did, why wouldn't you, number one, rob them when no one's home? You could go in and have the, you know, search the house, no problems, nobody die. And two, why kill them before you even find the money? There's no reason to kill them. Got out of hand. But I, And they were told to kill them anyway, so might as well do it they first didn't even, like, They asked for the money, but they didn't take them anywhere. They didn't make them find it. So that just tells me there's no high marijuana underground plant. They just like killing people. Swear to God. But they were told to kill them. If they needed to. But they shot them right away. Oh, it's see, not. I thought they said. No, you said you do what you need to do. To me, that would be kill them. Wait, wait till you're in the rest of this year. Because. You're going to die, Jen. You're going to die. You're going to shit. You're going to die. Chances are they're going to know who they are. So you need to kill them. The amount of money that the men had retrieved from the air vent differs on which one you ask. One of the men said it was 25000 while the other one said it was around 30000 Now, it seems to me here someone might be skimming off the top a little bit. Or they're and, just bad at math like you and I. And, you know, you, you can't really, how can you trust somebody that's a criminal? Hey, let's go in and steal some money and kill people and then trust mm-hmm. that they're going to be. Den of thieves. Mm-hmm. Right? Here's the doozy. While these heinous crimes are being committed, Carruth, you know, he dropped him off there. He went out and washed his car. He went to the car wash and was washing his car while these guys are doing this. He's got an alibi. He dropped them off and he went and washed the car. Really? Carruth comes back, picks up the men, and they go back to the house and divide up what they were able to get out of the house. The money out of the house. They go back and divide up the money. Carruth still maintains he had nothing to do with any of these murders. But what he did have was a hit list. Yeah, you heard me, a hit list. Mm -hmm. These guys made out a list of people who lived in and around the area that they believed kept money in their homes. On that list was Ratliff. And Boyer. It's terrible. Like, it's a legit list. And they, mm-hmm. right? Now, see, I thought you were actually going to say Carruth had a hit list of people he didn't like. So he was using this these men mm-hmm. to take them off one at a time. No, he's, which would be a really good idea. But no, or that never came out. Maybe that's the truth. But he didn't know Boyer at all. The other thing Carruth had was blood on his pants. Now, remember when he was arrested, he had blood all over his mm-hmm. clothes. So, you know, all this time, investigators are worried because he's like, I wasn't there. I didn't have anything to do with it. They didn't really have, they had the other criminals saying he was involved, but he's saying he's not. So then it becomes a he said, she said. So they were hoping that, you know, something would. They needed real evidence. They needed solid evidence. The other thing Carruth had was blood on his pants. Now, remember when he was arrested, the officer said that he had blood on his clothes, his hands and his shoes. So they went back, they pulled that and they tested it. That blood, thank goodness, would be proved to be, beyond the shadow of a doubt, Butch Boyer's blood. They had what they needed to tie him to the attempted murder of Butch Boyer, as well as placing him at the scene that night. Carruth and Brooks are charged with the kidnapping of Butch Boyer and the murder of 12-year-old Brett Boyer. Carruth is still maintaining, all this time, he was not involved in any of this. Mm -hmm. In September 2003, Carruth goes to trial to face charges for capital murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, and robbery. And you know who was there every single day to look him in the eye? Bravo. Bravo. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you be? Butch Boyer. 
I just, would be. I'd be front row sitting center. there, and he's like, ho, ho, you thought you killed me. You did not kill me down here, and you're gonna. So guess what? That's right. I'm yelling Oct- timber. You're going down. That's yeah. right. On October 9th, Michael Carruth is found guilty on all counts and is sentenced to death. Good. On February 9th, Jimmy Lee Brooks is found guilty on all counts as well and sentenced to death. James Gary goes to trial in 2005 for the murders of Thurman and Catherine Ratcliffe. On August 4th, 2005, James Gary is found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life without parole. Wow. So since this, Mm -hmm. Butch Boyer has never, we talked about this, he's never discussed this in public. And then when I came over and we were talking about this and I said it kind of, like I started to second guess myself because Mm -hmm. I felt guilty about that. But then part of me was like, those losers need to be outed for what they did. Yeah. Can you imagine? I don't think I would ever talk about it either. So here's the thing. It would be so difficult to do. And it's, I I know I wouldn't, but that's because I have hangups with the media, which is a whole nother story. So, you know, they, they're claiming that they were collecting money and all this. But you think about it. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the money at mm-hmm. all. They, I think they genuinely, I think Ruth liked to have that power over them. And those, he, he knew who to pick. He knew who to pick. Those guys that could never pay him back. And they were dumb enough to fall for that. Okay, you got to do me a favor. You got to help me here. Right? Mm-hmm. Because otherwise he could do it. How much does it really cost to do an underground marijuana hydroponic thing? I don't know, but who's laughing now? Because marijuana is legal in most places, so. Well, I know, but, well, that even makes the deaths more horrible. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's just stupid. I personally think that there was some kind of vendetta he had, that it was more of a hit list than he an actual. He didn't know them, though. Brooks is the one that had the dad that worked for But we don't know that Boyer. they don't have a vendetta. No, but he didn't. And then when he when he came to him and said, you have to work for me, and was, like, putting the pressure on him, he's like, okay, okay, I know somebody, I know somebody. And it was always, I think, it wasn't that I'm for sure. Well, the one said he saw it with his own eyes, which I don't believe for a second. But it was always like, hey, I think that they keep money in their house, right? And this was in the early 2000s. So it's not like it was in the, you know. Well, in cold blood, it was like the guy, people were talking in prison, right? And says they but he keep never money. Kept, they never did, though. That's the thing. I know. It was a, all a lie. So, I don't know. It's horrible. Don't keep money in your house, folks. <laughs> Well, just, it well, just still doesn't give you a right. It. Yeah. Like, what? Loser. Wow. Anyway. That's that it. poor baby. Poor people. Mm-hmm. Interesting story, Camille. Never heard it. I always say that. I know. You usually don't. Uh, if you did hear it, would you say it? Would you say, I've heard that story? Yeah, I have. Okay. Well, you, you, you'll you say, I've heard that story, but you've had new details. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. All right. What else? What you got? Um, like I said, we've got new sweatshirts, new t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts, new sweatshirts and hoodies in our store. And I found the link. It is etsy.com slash shop slash our true crime podcast. Hmm. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Mm -hmm. you need new uh, seasonal hoodie or nice long sleeve tee for when you're going out in the pumpkin patch Mm. or just to wear at family dinners. Thanksgiving's coming up (laughs) and Christmas. Anyway, go there and buy some of our uh, merch. merch. Help us support that way. Or help support us that way. There you go. And look good while you're doing it. Exactly. You can also try. I wouldn't uh, go that far. You can support us at our Patreon. And uh, we even have a link on our webpage if you want to support us at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. You might have to do the WWW beforehand, just like old times. But <laughs> I don't even we know don't what know. that means. I mean, World Wide Web? I do. No, I know that. But oh, I know and I also want to say this, you'll be hearing this on Camille's birthday. Happy mm-hmm. birthday, Camille. Yeah, right. Yay. 28 and a half. Again. Birthday. Mm-hmm. Again. All right, people. Again, you should be proud and say that you're 39. It's not that proud. I am proud. Mm-hmm. I would be proud to be 39. <laughs> you know what could be uh, worse? You could go back and be 16 again. I don't know. I kind of like 16. Oh, I hated teen years. My teddy teen bear awesome. t-shirt with the little red tank top underneath it. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's shoulder pads. Big shoulder pads. Remember? The shoulder mud pads. Yep. yep. I remember those. Big right. mall bangs. Well, thanks, Jen. Is that Thank it? you. Are That's it. Signing out? All right, you guys. Love you, mean it. And remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love you.
this is about right. Does this look okay? I think so. What about me? Yep. Sound okay? Yours always sound fine. Oh, yeah. No, I always sound like I have asthma. <sighs> and so I well, said. <laughs> at least you don't talk like that. Yeah, I think I do. Whatever. I at some points. This morning when Katrina called her mom. <clears throat> Sorry. Why am I get bigger? <laughs> Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Make Maybe I'll get you longer arms for your 50th birthday yeah, present. No Thank you. I just need something that goes like this. <clears throat> Sorry. To this day, I think they still find money around the place. How would you? I don't and I've never had enough money to hide. I know. Same. Like I said, I'm scrunching up, you know, $3 for the field trip. It's now clear, Jen. That's that why you have checks, Camille? Because you can just write like checks. Like you write. Oh, I, mm -hmm. I don't even have checks. Oh, well, I'd have a bunch Nor of do I balance a checkbook. I have, I I've not. never balanced a checkbook. Me neither. You just look, I got money in here. When the bank tells out. me that I've bounced checks, that's how I know how much money I have that's in my right. account. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't written a check since last week for a t shirt thing. Okay. Oh, no, for $20 cookie dough. Oh. That's what I had to write. The cookie dough. You got to keep giving. I got you. Yeah. Mr. Ratliff had worked his life as a salesman of the snap on tools, worked his entire life. You know what I mean? I read that wrong. <clears throat> I'm trying. You know what's in the back of my head? Cadence. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'm trying to like not do that. Am I doing it? Because I'm trying not to. Uh, there's been a couple times, but it's not anything okay. big. Okay. Whatever. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's not. That's not how we speak. No, but you should. Be but you know, Jen, the authorities were really trying to find out what was. That's, that's what how she talks. I was trying to. Yeah. I was trying to channel that. I guess I didn't do it so good. You have to do it more conversational. Remember, Jen. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. See, I can't even do it now. Don't even say my name. Just I keep doing how you do it. Sometimes I do that because I do like sticking it in there, but whatever. Never mind. <laughs> That's what he said. Right. You're oh, really sounding really fake. Uh, there. That's Sorry. what I was trying to get out. Okay. Oh? <laughs> exactly. Pal immediately calls dispatch, and he tells them the situation about what's going on. Dispatch. He, what did I say? Dispatch. 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 Is that not right? Dispatch. Okay. For some reason, it sounds wrong when you say it. So go ahead and do it. He call. He calls and tells dispatch. Okay. <laughs> it just sounded wrong when you said it. Sorry. Your face sounds wrong. It feels wrong today too. I'm gonna say that again because. But see, like sometimes it's that's how I talk in real life, people. Like if I'm trying to make a point, I'm like, "Can you believe he shoots him in the hand?" Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm gonna do that again. Ready? It's written awkwardly too. Thurman. I kept thinking of Thurman Mitchell. Do you remember Thurman mm -hmm. Mitchell? That's who immediately who I and Steve Thurman. That's who I immediately thought of when you said Thurman. Poor little Steve Thurman looked like Spock. I don't remember Steve Thurman, do I? Oh, yes, I do. He does look like Spock. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Without the pointy eyes. Because I remember my dad. Pointy ears. His dad, yeah. His dad was a um, client. His, Thurman's dad was, or Steve Thurman's dad. Steve Thurman's dad was your client? Was my dad's client 